The whole world depends on California for its almonds. But in recent years, the state has been rocked by record-breaking drought and floods. Weather whiplash. The years-long mega drought. That farmland is now gone. So does this mean the end for almonds? I've been following this year's harvest since February, when I showed you the world's largest pollination event. In fact, if you haven't seen part one, where I bust the number one myth about almonds and honeybees, then be sure to click that video at the end of this one. A quick disclosure, Blue Diamond Growers sponsored these episodes, but only under the usual True Food TV rules. They didn't get script approval, no video previews, zero input into this production. Okay, lovely people, almonds are often accused of being California's thirstiest crop. So let's begin there. This is California's Central Valley, home to more almonds than anywhere on the planet. 1.6 million acres. That's bigger than the state of Delaware. But that number actually marks a decline for the first time in decades. And it's almost all to do with water. Almonds thrive in a Mediterranean climate, which means they love hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. There are only five so-called Mediterranean climates in the world, including the Central Valley, whose rivers, reservoirs, canals, and aqueducts are fed by the Sierra Nevada mountains. At least that's how it's supposed to work. California's, California's crippling, crippling drought. The crippling drought. The driest in California's history. But years of historic drought has made that surface water scarce, forcing farmers of all crops to tap more and more into California's most precious resource, its aquifers. These giant reserves of groundwater that lie beneath the Earth's surface and which have been drained faster than they can be replenished. Cut to this year, and the picture looks very different. Irrigation canals are now brimming with water, thanks to intense rainfall and record-setting snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. But what may have seemed like welcome relief for California is far more complex. California needs water, but not like this. It's a main thoroughfare through some of America's most productive farmland. The record seven to 800 inches of snow it all points to a new norm of devastating weather ahead, both extreme drought and wet. And almond farmers are already paying the price. This spring, when we touched down to shoot the almond bloom, we had no idea what was brewing. So far, we've had a really good bloom, so I think people are pretty positive about this year, yeah. Literally the next day, the storms moved in. 31 atmospheric rivers record snowfall blasting Northern California. Nothing could stop the water. Orchards flooded, trees were downed, and the bees stopped pollinating because they don't work when it's wet and cold, and that ultimately means fewer nuts. This is the thing about farming. So much is beyond the farmer's control. We had record rainfall during bloom time, and it definitely had an impact on this crop. So we're seeing we're down anywhere from 20 to 30% in overall production. Storms delayed harvest, too. It's up to Lucas now to figure out how to pick 3,000 acres of almonds before the temperatures drop. Now we're going to get to the harvest action in just a bit. Tree shakers, drone shots, rockin' soundtrack, you know the drill. But first, let's tackle the question of almonds and water, because the frequently regurgitated notion that almonds are sucking California dry is based on decades-old data and, frankly, lazy journalism. California's almonds use no more water than walnuts or pistachios, but almonds get all the attention because they're a far larger crop. Since the 90s, almond growers have actually cut the amount of water they use by a third. Almonds now account for 21% of California's farmland, yet they use just 14% of the state's agricultural water. 
But there's something else, context, and it's critical here. Almonds are a nutrient-dense food, packed with protein, fiber, good unsaturated fats. There are plenty of thirsty crops grown in California that don't deliver the same energy as almonds. Hello, iceberg lettuce. But you know what outstrips them all in water use? Irrigated pasture that's grown to feed cows. So how have farmers like Lucas reduced their water use? Well, they now use micro-irrigation, which feeds water precisely to the roots of the tree. Super efficient, and 80% of almond farmers use it, way more than any other crop community in California. And the reason they care has a lot to do with simple economics. They know that if they can't grow their almonds sustainably, they don't have a future. Now I want to show you something else, but I need someone else's help. Finally, can you take this one? Oh yes. See this? These are cover crops. And in part one, I showed you how they play a critical role for the health of honeybees. But cover crops have other superpowers you may not know about. The roots of these plants help break up the soil and suck the water down. So when California's catastrophic storms hit earlier this year, the orchards with cover crops were the ones that absorb the water efficiently into the ground. And all that water helps restore the aquifers. When it's harvest time, these cover crops will be mowed down, they'll decompose, and their nutrients will boost the health of the soil. Did you say harvest? We gotta go meet up with Lucas. After the early spring bloom, the pollinated flowers drop their petals and transform into baby nuts, which mature through the summer until their hulls begin to crack, the sign that they're ready to harvest. Now it's September, and it's time to shake the ripe nuts free. After the shakers go through, sweepers gather the nuts into rows, where they'll dry on the orchard floor for several days. I've covered a lot of different harvests, but this is the first time I've ever had to wear a dust mask. Finally, it's time for the harvester to suck them up. Now, harvest may look relatively straightforward, but remember in part one where I told you that most almonds need cross-pollination. So in an orchard, there is at least two different varieties, and those varieties grow two different kinds of almonds that cannot be mixed up. So when Lucas's team comes in and picks up these almonds, he has to return and do all the processes again for a second variety, and in fact, this orchard has a third. Let me show you, I have these three varieties from this orchard. This tall, slender, big one is called Nonpareil. It's what you're going to find in most of your snack mixes. This smaller one, Price, you might find those in your chocolate-covered almonds. From the field, the nuts are trucked to a sheller. Both the outer hull and the shell inside are removed to reveal the kernel. That's the nut itself, and each one is cleaned and grated. At harvest time, shellers literally run 24-7. And believe it or not, this is one of the smaller facilities. From here, the almonds head to Blue Diamond's processing plants. Some nuts are destined to be snack nuts, some ground into flour, and others made into almond milk. Ah yes, almond milk, America's number one plant drink. Let's talk about that. I'm not going to get into the almond versus dairy milk nutrition debate. There's enough noise online about that. Have at it. But did you know how much waste almond breeze produces? 
Zero. Seriously, Blue Diamond mills its almonds into a creamy butter that's blended with water to become milk. There's no leftover pulp that gets trashed. In fact, nothing goes to waste. The skins are blanched off and go into cattle feed. Same with the hulls. That offsets the need to grow other crops for that purpose. The shells, too, they're used as livestock bedding. And one last thought to leave you with. Almond milk has a lower carbon footprint than any other milk, less than oat, rice, soy, and way less than dairy. Almond trees, see, do a fantastic job at capturing carbon. And now farmers are moving toward a new thing called whole orchard recycling, which means instead of burning trees at the end of their life cycle, they're ground down and mixed back into the soil, adding nutrition, boosting water efficiency and keeping that carbon instead of releasing it back into the atmosphere. So, yeah, the challenges keep on coming, but so does change. Now, do things need to change when it comes to the health of our honeybees? I mean, are almonds killing our bees? To find that out, you're going to have to click part one. I'll see you over there. <laughs>